What I, there's lots and lots of material. I feel like module D is what everybody else didn't want to lecture, and so they just put it all together, and I have it. I inherited mm -hmm. it. So it is a lot. So the way I have divided it up, um, you actually have to divide it up in two ways. When you look at it, um, you have all the different content. At the very bottom, you have a folder that says emerging infections. Okay? On it, I say, hey, this is on the final only. Because it's just too much to try and test you on just one 50 item, 50 item test. So that emerging infections, you don't have to, you don't need to know it for module D exam, but that material will be on the final. Okay? Um, it's things you're probably, most of it you've been familiar with. It's like VRE, MRSA, C. diff, um, the different types of isolations and like, you know, how you gown out for it. Um, hemorrhagic fever, Lyme disease, pediatric immune deficiencies. Okay, so I have that all Camtasia. You have videos, mine are like no more than 15 minutes. Now the pediatric aspect, I did ask Ms. Fuller to do those um, Camtasias for me and she did, but she went over the time frame just a little bit. That's okay, we love Ms. Fuller. Okay, so just she said to tell y'all to pop some popcorn and just watch it. <laughs> this is like 45 minutes, 55 <laughs> minutes. She just said she loved it all and couldn't cut any of it out. It was all necessary. <laughs> so I'm, I'm sorry. Okay, so just go ahead. But that's going to be on the final only. So everything under that folder, it tells you right there for final only. So um, prior to the final, watch that material and make sure because I have um, Camtasia's and I have the PowerPoints and everything all in that folder that you need. So what we're going to cover and what's testable in here is we're going to cover um, immune response. We are going to cover um, allergies. We're going to cover SLE. We're going to cover HIV and AIDS. Uh, and we're going to cover COVID. Okay. So that's what will be on module, module D. So I really need to start with giving you a background. So in your book, on chapter, let's see, it's chapter 16, okay? Chapter 16 really just lays the foundation for you understanding about immunity and the different types of immunity, okay? So please take a little bit of time and read through that so that you have a better understanding because it lays the groundwork of everything we're gonna talk about. We're gonna talk about all these immune deficiencies, all these diseases, and it's all directly related back to how your immune system either is working or it's not working. So you gotta kinda know like what's the normal so you'll have a basis for comparison later, okay? So the one thing I want you to understand is that your immune system, it has three main functions, okay? So let's talk about these three main functions. The official definition for immunity is state, uh, it's a state of responsiveness to any foreign substance, such as a microorganism, uh, tumor proteins, okay? So the three things your immune system does, and the thing you have to understand is your immune system is on 24-7. It doesn't take a break. And we don't want it to take a break, because if it takes a break, then we get sick. But it's constantly surveilling, okay? So what you need to realize about that is that mutations continually arise in your body. But normally they're recognized as foreign cells and they're destroyed. That's because you, you have a functioning immune system. The other thing they do is by constantly surveilling and getting rid of cells that are not self cells, it maintains homeostasis. Homeostasis, all that means, guys, is that the body cells remain uniform and unchanged. Okay? And then the third thing is its main role is defense. So remember your immune system protects against evasion from microorganisms. It also helps in the prevention of the development of infections. Okay? So those three things are what your immune system should be doing. Now, the thing I always like to talk about, I like to talk about how your immune system recognizes you. I know I talked a little bit about this in module E, so I'm gonna briefly touch on it. Remember that all cells in your body have this protein on them. This protein contains this very specific marker. It's your HLA type. Remember that stands for human leukocyte antigen. Okay. 
So remember, all the body cells, they're surrounded by that plasma membrane. It contains the HLA. Remember, your HLA is inherited from your parents, and it determines the tissue type that you have. I want you to think about it as your universal barcode. You are unique. The only exception to that is if you have an identical twin, okay? Because if they're identical, then they have the same HLA type. But if you're not identical, then you have HLA typing that is unique to only you. That HLA type, think about it as a universal barcode. It is on all your cells throughout your body. And remember, your immune system, it's constantly surveilling all the cells throughout your body, and it's looking for that barcode. It's looking for that HLA type. And as long as when it's doing its surveilling, it encounters that, then nothing's going to happen. Everything's good. But the minute it comes in contact with something that does not have the same HLA or quote unquote barcode, that's when your immune system is going to say, oh, wait a minute. This is not a cell cell. I've got to get rid of it. And it starts mounting an attack. Okay? Well, the key to that, guys, that is self recognition or something we call self tolerance. Okay? That HLA is what determines your self tolerance. And that is your immune system's ability to distinguish self from non-self proteins and or cells. Okay. So for example, some non-self cells. Um, it could be cancer cells, because remember it's mutated some way so it doesn't have the same HLA. Uh, it could be cells from another person or any type of invading organism. Those are all examples of non-self cells. So here's another great example right here. When you look at this picture, what I want you to appreciate is I want you to see how the immune cell, that's the yellow cell, it's attacking the orange cell, which is the anthrax. The reason this yellow cell is attaching the anthrax is because when the immune system surveyed it, this anthrax didn't have the same HLA. And so the immune system says, uh-uh, you don't belong. And it starts attacking it to get rid of it because it's not a cell cell. That's what your immune system is doing 24-7. And that's what keeps you uniform and that's what keeps you healthy. Now the other thing I need you to realize is that most of the things we talk about affect maybe just one organ. Well, when you talk about immunity, there's not one single organ. You have lots of different organs that are involved in immunity. Okay? And so this is kind of an example. So realize that immune cells, they come from bone marrow. Okay? And they begin life as a stem cell. And we like stem cells because remember stem cells, they can become whatever is needed. So in this instance, they mature into white blood cells. Okay. And what happens is these white blood cells, they provide immunity through actions such as um, recognition of self versus non-self, destruction of foreign cells, um, and they can also produce antibodies. So when you look at this, what you have to realize is a lot of different organs play a part in how well your immune system functions. For example, tonsils. Uh, probably about 20 years ago, if you ever had problems with your tonsils, we would just remove them. We kind of thought of them as like an accessory organ. But what we found out was through research, tonsils actually serve a purpose. They help with starting the inflammation process. And so because we found that out, we don't just arbitrarily take out people's tonsils. You have to meet a criteria now. For example, you have to have so many cases of strep throat, um, and et cetera, et cetera, before they will even consider removing your tonsils. Because what we found was when we removed a person's tonsils, it could imp impact their immunity. The same thing with the spleen. I know I talked about a module C. We talked about the spleen and how a person can live without their spleen. Absolutely, yes, they can. But remember, the spleen plays a part in immunity. So if you remove their spleen, then they're more susceptible to different types of invading organisms. Okay? okay. So those are just things you gotta realize. So like with the uh, tonsils, um, you know, you said you had to meet a certain criteria. How come you still see like young kids getting removed? Because they've met that criteria. It's usually so many um, infections, so many strep throats or tonsillitis. But once they meet that criteria, or it might be because they have sleep apnea because of enlarged tonsils, they, they've met criteria and they can remove them. Okay? But we don't just take them out just for somebody that keeps getting sore throats. They have to 
like your insurance has a, um, they have a plan and they follow what evidence-based practice says as far as removing them, okay? So this is what you have to realize is that immunity is, is throughout your body. Now, the other thing about immunity, we have things that can alter it, okay? Some things that can alter it, of course, when I talk about environmental conditions, um, really it's exposure to things such as radiation or here in the South, pesticides. It's something that can damage the cell on a cellular level, okay? That can impact that person's immune function. When we talk about drugs here, you wanna think things like steroids. So immunosuppressants. We have lots of people that are immunosuppressants for a lot of different reasons. Another drug that can alter someone's immune function, uh, think about your chemo drugs, guys. See, the problem with chemo, remember, it kills the good along with the bad. So because of that, that happens, we're killing off good cells that help with the immune function. So that can put this person at a disadvantage. Okay. Uh, comorbidities, what else is going on with them? When I talk about vaccine status, really what I mean by vaccine status, we know that people that are unvaccinated, that they can have impairments in their immune system, okay? So what I mean when I talk about vaccine status is I want you to realize that here in the United States, we actually are very blessed in the fact that we do have ac access to vaccines. We have lots of countries that don't have access to vaccines, okay? Um, and when you don't have access to vaccines, then you are more susceptible to certain types of um, infections, okay? For example, right now we have everything going on in the Ukraine. A lot of the refugees that are crossing borders, what we are having, we're having outbreaks of polio, guys. Polio in the United States, it was eradicated back in the 1970s. We no longer vaccinate anybody for polio here in the United States. So if some of those refugees were to come over here in the United States and they happen to have polio, then what you could anticipate is we would have widespread outbreaks of polio. So that's what I mean, like not all countries have access to vaccines. Or if you think about it, um, a lot of people that have like a, a lower socioeconomic status, they don't have access to vaccines. Sometimes it's because they don't have the means to get to the, the clinics that have the vaccines or maybe it might be a lack of knowledge. So that's one reason why when people come into the hospital, we usually ask about their vaccination status. I mean, now of course it's the, you know, it's the big COVID thing, but even before then we asked about them because we're seeing a reoccurrence of certain things that we didn't used to have. For example, measles, mumps, rubella. We're getting a lot of that now. Okay, I just took care of a patient that had measles a couple weeks ago. And that's just because people either don't have access or they're choosing not to vaccinate. And what you have to understand, that's a person's individual right to vaccinate or not to vaccinate. In healthcare, we just need to be aware of if someone's unvaccinated, they might be at risk for, okay? And kind of go at it from there. We're not gonna change anybody's mind about vaccines, that's not our place. We just need to be aware if I'm taking care of this person who has not been vaccinated for whatever, it might put them at a higher risk, so I would need to be more careful about certain things, okay? Uh, and then you gotta talk about age. So if you were in your 20s and 30s, raise your hand. No, I'm not in my 20s or 30s, but <laughs> <laughs> be proud. Oh, me. What are you like, are you trying to claim it, not trying to claim it? No, I mean, I am in my 30s. Okay, raise your hand. Now I want you to look at your classmates. Guys, this is the best they're ever gonna be. Right <laughs> now. Okay, y'all put your hands down. When I talk about immune status, okay? Your immune system is at its prime in your 20s and 30s. Oh, God. Okay? I know. It's something to look forward to. <laughs> However, as you age, your immune function um, decreases. It's not as effective. It doesn't respond as quickly. It's tired and it gets slow. Okay? So now you know why your older individuals are more at risk for infection and or cancer development because their immune system isn't what it once was. So all those things have an impact on your immune function. Now you have a table, it's on page 309, okay? And it talks about age-related changes in immunity. Now, 
Now, when we talk about immunity, one thing you have to understand, we have different types. But for a person to be um, complete, have complete immunity, you gotta have all, all of them. We have something we call general immunity, okay? General immunity is also called innate immunity. That just simply means, guys, you're born with it. Innate is you're born. You can't transfer it to somebody else. So some great examples of general immunity. One is inflammation, okay? But then also think about your skin, mucosa membranes, your gastric acid, okay? That's all examples of general immunity. Then what you have is something called adaptive immunity, okay, or acquired. Please don't get confused by the terminology because in your book, they'll use acquired and adaptive, but it means the same thing, okay? So general immunity has a very quick, rapid response, okay? Adaptive acquired, it takes a little bit. It takes several days before it starts working. Okay. And the two types of adaptive that we're going to talk about, one is cell mediated and one is antibody mediated. So guys, you got to have all these processes in place to have full immunity. And they feed off of each other. Remember, it all starts with inflammation. and kind of goes from there. So while we don't really like inflammation, it serves a purpose. Now, when you talk about inflammation or when you talk about general immunity, okay, two key points I really need you to remember. One, it is a nonspecific body defense. Okay. And then number two, it provides immediate but short-term protection. And the problem with that, guys, is it doesn't provide any type of true immunity on repeat exposure to the same organism or injury. So let me explain what I mean by that, okay? What happens if you are stung by a bee? What happens at that site? Swells up, becomes red, swollen, it hurts, becomes warm, don't move it as well, right? Okay. Well, let's say I go out in the woods next week and I get stung by a bee. What's going to happen? Same, same thing. Oh, you mean it's not specific? It doesn't matter what causes it. I'm going to have these same signs and symptoms. Yeah, that's what I mean by that. So you call them the cardinal. Um, I should say they're called cardinal signs of inflammation. Okay. So if you think sprained ankle, you will get it every single time. Because what happens is the area becomes very red and it becomes warm. And the reason that is, is all the blood's rushing to it because it's trying to repair it. Okay? You have this release of histamine. So, or histamine. So when the histamine's released, it makes the area become very red, very swollen. Okay? The other thing that's going on there is the swelling is actually, it's a little pocket of edema. It's to prevent any further injury from taking place. So it just is providing an extra layer of protection. And it hurts, so you're not gonna move it as much because that could potentially make it worse. So while inflammation is painful, it does serve a purpose. So it's a non-specific body defense. It doesn't matter what causes it or how many times it occurs, the same thing's gonna happen. Because think about it. Think about it when you sprain your ankle. Does it not become red and swollen? It becomes hot. It hurts, so you don't move it as much. It's supposed to do that. So inflammation is a nonspecific. Doesn't matter what triggers it, you're gonna have the same cardinal manifestations, okay? That's the first thing. The second thing, what I mean by it provides immediate but short-term protection, and it doesn't <coughs> provide true immunity, it doesn't matter how many times I get stung by a bee or how many times I sprain my ankle. The same thing's gonna happen. It doesn't protect me from it because y'all have already told me if I get stung by a bee today, then if I get stung later this week, the same thing's gonna happen. It doesn't provide a true immunity. So those are your two key points you wanna remember about your inflammation, okay? It's non-specific. it doesn't matter what causes it, you're gonna have the same five things occur. 
Now, I will say um, how severe those symptoms are, well, they can depend, depending on, for example, like the bee sting. If I got stung once or maybe I got stung 10, you would expect more inflammation. But still, the same process is in place, okay? And we need inflammation because what inflammation does, guys, is it starts the antibody-mediated and also the cell-mediated immunity. And that just engages everything so you have a full immune response. So let's talk about some of the cells that you'll see um, in inflammation. And you do have a chart. Your chart is, let's see, table 16-1 on page 309. So some of the cells that you'll see, uh, your neutrophils, of course. The thing about neutrophils is they don't live very long. I tell you they only live up to about 18 hours. So you are continuously producing neutrophils. Okay. The other thing that's neat about neutrophils, uh, probably about the last 10 years, we have been using something we call an ANC. It stands for an absolute neutrophil count. This is pretty cool because what we can do, this, this lab test, it measures the number of mature circulating neutrophils. And by doing that, guys, we can actually measure the client's risk for infection. So when you're looking at an A and C level, your normal range is, um, when you look on a lab report, it's say 1.5 to 8. Okay, so realize like they, and when you look at lab reports, a lot of times they leave off all the zeros. So that's 1,500 to um, 8,000, okay? But when you're looking at lab report, it'll say normal range 1.5 to 8. So what you need to realize is the higher the number, the greater resistance to infection that person has. The lower the number, the more likely they are to develop an infection. So we're actually doing this on people that come in for um, things like if, if you think they're at risk for sepsis, or they come in with wounds that aren't healing, or something that can lead to sepsis. Like we're looking at their ANC level. And it's not that we're gonna provide different care to this person versus someone else. We just need to recognize if someone has a lower ANC level that I need to be more um, assertive, aggressive in the interventions that I'm doing because I know they have a greater potential for developing an infection. Other things that you'll see, uh, macrophages, um, your basophils, again, remember your basophils, they release the heparin or the histamine and that causes um, your symptoms of infla uh, inflammation. Eosinophils. Uh, eosinophils, you'll see these um, when you do a CBC with diff. Okay. And the purpose of your eosinophils, it kind of keeps um, inflammation process in check, okay? So it limits uh, the actual response to the inflammatory um, process. So if you are looking at lab work and you see someone that has a high eosinophils, you know they have recently come in contact with something they're allergic to, okay? So these are some of the cells you're going to see when you talk about inflammation. Now, one important thing I want you to understand is inflammation and infection are not the same thing, guys, okay? You can have inflammation without infection. I gave you two examples. I said sprained ankle, I said bee sting. But think you could, you could have um, a blister, allergic rhinitis, uh, a myocardial infarction. That's inflammation without infection. But realize if your patient's to the point where they have infection, at some point, they had inflammation, we just didn't catch it. And that's where it went into the infection there, okay? So let's move on and talk about antibody-mediated immunity. So again, this is a considered an adaptive immunity. And this immunity takes, it takes a couple days before it starts developing, okay? When you think about antibody-mediated immunity, what I always want you to think about is B cells. So put a big B cell beside antibody-mediated immunity. Okay. So y'all remember from A&P what your B cells do? No takers. I'm gonna tell you, it's okay, I'll tell you. Okay, I know your brain's tired. Here's what B cells do. They help memorize things. They're called memory cells, okay? 
So, <laughs> so every time your B cell comes in contact with a foreign antigen, it analyzes it and it remembers it and it starts developing antibodies that are specific for that antigen. Okay? So what happens is, Infl your immune system recognizes something, a non-self cell. Okay? So then it sends out an immune response. And so all your little helpers, your white blood cells come in and your immune system says, no, nah, I need some B cells. Okay? So what happens is these B cells Met, or they, I should say they study the antigen, whatever it might be, the foreign substance, and they start developing antibodies specific to that. So it's, it's pretty cool. Once that occurs, we call them sensitized B lymphocytes. So the reason this is pretty cool is because this type of immunity helps prevent adults from becoming ill with an infectious disease more than once. I always like to use chicken pox as an example, okay? So, once someone comes in contact with the chicken pox virus, okay, and they catch chicken pox, well, their immune system, it does mount an attack and it sends out these B cells, but it takes these B cells a little while to start developing these antibodies against this very specific chicken pox. So what happens is, um, usually the person will feel really bad for about four or five days. And then, by that time, these B cells are producing all these antibodies and the person's gonna have a turnaround, they're gonna start feeling better. You're gonna see them get better. The chicken pox are gonna start drying up, they're gonna start crusting over. And that's because they developed this antibody that was very specific. So what happens is, if the person ever comes in contact with chicken pox again, two things will happen. Either one, they will display no signs or symptoms of chicken pox because as soon as it gets into the person's body, the body recognizes that, oh, I know what this is. And it sends those sensitized B cells that produce those antibodies and so the person never gets sick, has no sign or symptoms. That's the first thing that can happen. The second thing that can happen is the person can have chicken pox, but it's a very mild case compared to their, their previous one. Okay? So that's the, that's the great thing about antibody-mediated immunity. Now, when we talk about antibody, we also got to talk about immune globulins, okay? Because these immune globulins, um, what they do is they line different areas of our body, or we find them in different areas of our body, and they contain some of the antibodies that we need. So some of these you'll probably be familiar with. Um, you do have a table. It is on, let me tell you. It's on page 317, table 16-2. So these antibodies, they line certain areas of your body, and again, it's just to help prevent any type of foreign organism from entering. For example, your IgA. So you find your IgA in all your body secretions. So, you know, your tears, your saliva. Um, you can find it in breast milk, colostrum. So the IgA, it also lines all your mucosa membranes. Um, so you wanna think, um, your upper and lower respiratory tract, your GI tract, your GU tract. Because remember, we have lots of mucosa membranes all throughout those. And so it's most effective at preventing infection in those areas. So when you talk about your IgG, remember this one? Um, it actually will cross the placenta. And so it pro will provide that newborn with that passive acquired immunity. Now, when you think about your IgM, um, what I want you to realize about your IgM, that is the one that is most, or I should say, primary responsible for the initial immune response. And then when you talk about IgD, I want you to think about IgDs as helpers. They help your B cells in differentiating between the different types. Okay. So that IgD is more of a, more of a helper. And then your IgE, 
Your IgE, again, is found in your plasma, it's found in your interstitial fluids, and it causes the symptoms of an allergic reaction. So let's talk about how you acquire antibody immunity. Okay. Uh, you can either actively acquire it or passively acquire it. Actively acquire it, this is when antigens enter the body and antibodies are made. Okay. It can occur naturally through the person catching the disease or the virus or artificially through um, immunizations okay, with a less virulent antigen. So here's the thing you have to realize. Natural active is the most effective, it's the longest lasting because your body played an active role in developing um, the antibody. When we talk about artificial passive, those are things like vaccines, the immunizations we have to do. The thing you have to realize about vaccines, almost all of them require some type of booster. Okay, because what happens is we use a less virulent antigen and so we didn't produce the amount of antibodies that we would normally produce if we were to catch it ourselves and so your body tends to forget this over time um, so for example like for my people to get their chicken pox vaccine typically you have to get one every 10 years like your DTaP the same thing okay um, well COVID's another example they're telling you that you know you need to get all these COVID boosters so that's, again, just an example of your artificial active. Now, when you talk about passive, what you need to realize here, these are when antibodies are in the person's body, but they weren't created there. Okay? So because they weren't created there, it's just only going to provide immediate, short-term protection against a very specific antigen. So we have natural, and we have artificial, natural like mother to baby, across the placenta, or while the, um, as long as the mother breastfeeds the infant, the baby will have that um, passive immunity, okay? Then when you talk about artificial, this is for very specific situations. Um, down here in the south, one we use a lot, um, your anti-snake venom, okay? We have lots of snakes down here, uh, and so what you have to realize is your snake anti-venom, it's good for that one time only. If you were to, let's say you got, you got bit yesterday and you went to the hospital and you got antivenom. The antivenom is not going to be, it's not going to stay in your system long enough. If you get bit in three months, you'll have to go back to the hospital and get another one because it only provides immediate short-term um, relief. Uh -huh. Part of the antivenom um, is expensive. Mm -hmm. It's very, very expensive. And we don't. Typically here, we will get it, but most people, the problem we have with a lot of the snake bites is we have these snakes that are breeding that aren't native to this area. And so what that's causing is some of the snakes that people encounter, the antivenom is not as effective as it once was. So a lot of times what we're having to do is we'll treat them with antivenom, but oftentimes we'll still have to ship them out. And usually we ship them to like Birmingham because they'll need a little bit more intensive um, therapy because most of the time the area where the snake bite was where the venom was injected it's going to need a lot of debridement and a lot of additional healing time so yeah okay. so this is antibody made immunity b cells equal mammary cells so now let's switch over to cell mediated immunity when you think cell mediated immunity i want you to big, put a big t cell okay and y'all are probably a little bit more familiar with T cells. But when you talk about cell mediated immunity, what you have to realize here, this is just an immune response that doesn't involve antibodies, but rather the activation of the macrophages in your natural killer cells. Okay? It also um, involves the production of antigen uh, specific um, T lymphocytes and also the release of cytokines, okay, in response to an antigen. So T cells, remember, aid in the recognition of self versus non-self cells. That's your primary role when you talk about um, T cells.
So when you talk about T cells, realize that cell mediated immunity is most effective in destroying like virus infected cells, um, intercellular bacteria, and cancers. Okay, it's also very helpful in stopping the metastasis um, after exposure to a cancer causing substance. So when you think about cell mediated, you have T cells. You have helper T cells, you have suppressor T cells, you have natural killer cells. Okay. So when you look at lab reports, your helper T cell or your inducer T cell is referred to as your CD4 cell count. Okay. Its most important role is recognizing self versus non-self cells. That's its most important role. Okay. So T cells, they just enhance the overall immune function by increasing stem cell production. So if I have an inducer T cell, well then I gotta have a suppressor T cell because if I have one set of cells saying, um, hey, I need more of you, I need more of you, I need something else that says, whoa, I got enough. Those are your suppressor T cells, okay? And the reason that your T8 is so important is because it helps prevent the development of any type of self antibody from being formed meaning antibodies against normal healthy cell cells. And then you have your NK cells, uh, known as your CD16. These are also called natural killer cells. So when you think about natural killer cells, remember these are most effective in destroying unhealthy, abnormal cells. For example, cancer cells. Because I told you when we were talking um, about some of our oncology in Module C, I said that we actually have developed um, biological responses, all this targeted therapy, and we can enhance the patient's own immune system to where they produce more natural killer cells. And so the immune system is trying to take care of itself and destroy those cancer cells because we're producing more of these cells. So we're just enhancing. So all these cells are regulated by cytokines. What you have to realize is that these cytokines, they are produced by the white blood cells. And it just regulates cell mediated immunity. So these protein-like substances, they work like hormones in the fact that they regulate how and when certain cells need to respond. So cytokines are a good thing. Um, currently, we have over 100 different types of cytokines. You even have a table. Um, it talks about cytokines. It is on page 320. It's table 16.3. So some of these um, we've talked about. And they're really, really good in helping um, enhance the immune function for example, you have your interleukin-1, okay? So remember your interleukin-1, that induces a fever and also the production of those CD4 cells. So they help produce more T cells. Your interleukin-2, guys, that enhances those natural killer cells. And it aids in the destruction of cancer cells. Okay, that's why we often use it in cancer treatments. Um, you have things like your erythropoietin. Uh, again, enhances the production of red blood cells. You have your thrombopoietin enhances the production of platelets, okay? So these cytokines play a very important role in the immune function. The problem is, is if they're unregulated, okay? What can happen is over time, it can lead to chronic inflammation. It can lead to the development of autoimmune diseases or even sepsis. So it's really important that we have these cytokines in check and that they are, um, they are responding appropriately, so we don't have the development of some of these autoimmune diseases. So that all being said, when you think about transplant rejection, what I need you to realize with transplant rejection is T cell, or I should say cell mediated immunity, plays a huge part in this, okay? I know you probably talked a little bit about this when you talked about E, you talked about kidney transplants, but I'm gonna touch on it. And the reason that is, is because of all the different HLA types. So realize our goal when we are transplanting a solid organ, we try and get as close of an HLA match as possible. 
The only way you can get identical, of course, if you have an identical twin. But for everybody else, we try and get as close as possible because the closer we get the HLA type, the less likely that um, they are going to have a rejection issue, okay? However, realize that over time, the body will recognize it as foreign and it will try and attack it, okay? Unless we intervene medically, and that's what we do. That is why when someone has a solid organ transplant, they, I should say, an adult has a solid organ transplant, they are going to have to be on lifelong immunosuppressants, okay? Because their immune system is just, it functions too well. We gotta suppress it so it doesn't recognize this as a non-self and try and destroy it. So when we talk about the different types of um, rejections, we have several different, okay? We have hyperacute, acute, and chronic. So let me kind of tell you the difference. So a hyperacute, it begins within minutes. Okay. Now it can occur with any transplant, but it is most common with kidneys. Okay. Um, so the symptoms are going to be widespread cell destruction. Okay. And a hyperacute graft rejection, our only means what we need to do is we gotta remove it. As soon as we identify that's the type of rejection that's occurring. Now, there are two things that make a person more prone to develop a hyperacute graft rejection, and I want you to think about why this might be. Multiple pregnancies and or multiple blood transfusions. Because remember, with each one of those experiences, you're introducing that individual to more and more antibodies. They're becoming more sensitized. So it increases their likelihood of them having a reaction when you introduce something else to them, okay? The next type of rejection we can have, it could be acute graft rejection, okay? It takes a little longer for us to be able to recognize this, um, usually within a, anywhere from a week to three months. We recognize acute graft rejection because whatever organ was transplanted, it'll start showing impairment. So for example, let's use our kidneys, okay? Um, if we suspect acute graft rejection, when we look at their uh, lab work related to the kidneys, we will see impaired function, okay? And that lets us know that, uh-oh, they have some type of acute graft um, rejection going on, so we need to medically intervene, maybe do some rescue therapy to try and halt that, okay? And then the last type of rejection is something that's called chronic rejection, okay? So as I put right here, um, this just occurs continuously and it's long lasting. What you have to realize is there's no clear cause um, and there's no cure for chronic rejection, okay? We can delay it, but usually it occurs in all non-identical siblings because they have different HLA type, okay? So that's why I tell you sometimes, um, just because someone has an organ transplant, it doesn't mean that that organ's gonna last that person's entire life. Most organs kind of have like a I know it's a morbid thing to say, but kind of like a shelf life. They're good for this many years. Now, there's lots of variables. So I have taken care of patients that have had the same kidney for 20 plus years. But then I've also taken care of people that have had like, they're on their third kidney. So it just kind of, it just kind of depends there, okay? But what you have to realize is our ultimate goal is for this transplanted organ to last as long as it can in that individual. And the way we have to um, help do that is we have to intervene with medications. So realize that someone that has a solid organ transplant, they are going to be on lifelong medications. It's really important that these medications are given at the same time every day. Because the way they stay therapeutic is they maintain the same levels in the bloodstreams, okay? When we delay them or uh, maybe give them in smaller dosage, well, then that's when you start, you're gonna start having some more um, problems. So typically what you're gonna see, you're gonna see just your general steroids, okay? So your corticosteroids, those are just used for general immunosuppression, okay? So here's the thing, guys. If you have someone on steroids, you need to realize a couple things. One, steroids can increase the blood sugar, so check your sugars. Two, they can mask the signs and symptoms of infection, so we really need to teach these people to monitor their temperature um, very closely. And then three, they are more likely to develop, um, 
I should say, they're more likely to, to develop infections, and so they need to just general avoid crowds. If they're gonna go out, these are the people we want to wear the mask because we want to prevent and protect them from everybody else, okay? We talk about good hand washing. We talk about staying away from sick people. Okay. So those are some things that we really, um, we really need to talk to them about. Now, some other medications that you're gonna see um, added, you will see inhibitors added and your anti um, prophylactics and what these are for, guys, all this does, remember we talked about interleukin-2, okay? It's going to um, either stop the production or decrease the production of your interleukins-2. Because the interleukin-2 is really, it, remember one of its main roles is it produces those natural killer cells, which are really good for self versus non-self cells. So if we stop the production of those or slow it down, then the cells aren't going to be as able to readily recognize that it's not a cell to cell. Okay? Now, the dosage the person's on, guys, it varies. Okay? So that's something you gotta be that's something you gotta be aware of. But what happens is if we have this person on maintenance, and let's say they start showing signs of acute graft rejection, okay, then what we will do, we will bring them into a hospital setting and we'll give them the same medications. We'll just give them in higher dosage and we'll switch it from PO to IV. Okay? We call it rescue therapy. Um, the other thing that uh, we oftentimes will do is we can even um, give, I should say, uh, we'll give some monoclonal and what that's going to try and do, it helps, again, stop the activation of the T lymphocytes. Okay, so that's what we'll do to try and prevent a transplant rejection. So. That's it. What? Yay! <laughs> okay, if you give me like, I can get through SLE in 10 minutes. That's fair. Okay. You still the lights on, I thought it was over. Look at that. No, 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 let me go to SLE real quick. Then I'll be done for now. Okay. In your book, it starts on page 354. Let me make sure I'm giving you the right page number. Yeah. Well, actually, 353. It's only talk. It's from 353 to like 357 is where you're at there. Okay. So when we talk about lupus. Realize there's two types of lupus, okay? We have something we call discoid lupus. Discoid lupus, guys, only affects the skin. The person will have like these coin-like lesions all throughout their skin. That's not what this PowerPoint is covering, okay? So we deal more with um, SLE, systemic lupus, okay? So let me tell you what you need to realize about SLE. It is a chronic, progressive, inflammatory, Connected tissue disorder. Okay. That can cause major body organ failures. In almost all cases of SLE, guys, you're going to have some degree of kidney involvement. Okay. So think about that. SLE. Chronic, progressive, inflammatory, connected tissue disorder. We do not have a cure for it, guys. Do not. This is an autoimmune, it's considered a type three reaction. It's an autoimmune disorder. We can't cure it. But we can treat it, right? We treat it, but we can't cure it, okay? So when you think about SLE, um, what we have found out, we do know that it's more common in women between the ages of 20 and 40. And it's also more prevalent among our African American women. Okay. They have been cases in, in men and in children, but primarily African American women ages of 20 and 40. Okay. There is a genetic link, so oftentimes you'll see this run in families. Okay. We're still doing a lot of research to try and figure out exactly what happens, but we know it's an autoimmune disorder. And so what happens is, 
as I tell you right here, the person has a defect in their immune system, in which the immune system, for whatever reason, is unable to determine self versus non-self cells, so it triggers inflammation. So when you talk about SLE, what you have to realize is the person will have periods of quote-unquote normalcy or like their baseline, and then they're going to have flare-ups, okay? But it is a chronic progressive disorder. So what that means is over time, it'll get worse. Now, when we, when we talk about what do you look for to diagnose someone with SLE, here's the thing you have to realize. There's no one single test that you can use to diagnose someone with SLE. It's actually hard to diagnose someone with SLE. It's one of those we, we kind of rule out everything else, and then we figure, oh, it must be SLE. So we look at some of the physical assessments that you, could, you will see, and you have a, let's see, a chart. It's on page 354. It's called Key Features of SLE. One of the key features, um, and the other thing you have to realize is not everybody presents the same. Some people will have all of these key features. Others will have maybe just one or two of them. Okay. But they have a great picture of the rash that, you, um, that most people see or they think of SLE. They think of the butterfly rash. So um, it's figure 18.5. And you can see when you look on this um, lady's face, she has areas that, um, of redness along her cheeks, her chin, um, her forehead that looks like a butterfly. Okay. So that's a great... Um, that's a great example. So in your African-American population, what you will see is they will just have darker masks there, okay? The problem with this mask, sometimes it's really hard to hide with makeup, and so sometimes self-esteem is, is an issue there, okay? People sometimes become very sensitive um, about the rash. But other things that you're going to see when, um, or I should say, physical assessments, one is when you look at your... Um, Cardiac, pericarditis is very common among this population, okay? So you want to make sure and follow up with any type of sharp shooting chest pain. Let's follow up on that, okay? Pulmonary, about 50% of people who have SLE, they develop either pneumonia or pleural effusion. So if you know that half of the population is going to develop this, then lungs are a key priority for you. So Let's make sure, what's our O2 stats? What do my lungs sound like? Okay. What are my ABGs? The other thing you have to be really aware of is your renal function. The leading cause of death currently in this population is lupus nephritis. Okay. So kidneys are a really high priority. Watch your eyes and nose. Look at your kidney function. Watch for... Um, fluid retention. They also, about 90% of this population will develop generalized um, polyarthritis. So polyarthritis is just, they have arthritis throughout all their joints. Because remember, it's a connective tissue disorder. So oftentimes it's very painful at times for them. They also have um, generalized weakness and fatigue. And when I say fatigue, it's not like, you know, we work a 12-hour shift and we're tired afterwards. It's a fatigue that they get really tired, go to the bathroom and back to their couch where it's mount. Okay. So what you have to realize is, I tell you, it affects most people between the ages of 20 and 40. Most people are really active during that time. They have lots going on. Um, most women have kids. Okay. So you can see how this could greatly impact this individual's life. So in addition to the physical assessments, you got to worry a little bit about the psychosocial assessment. As I told you, the um, rash they have on their face, sometimes, again, it can cause some self-esteem issues. The diagnosis of SLE often leads to a less active lifestyle. It might even have mean a career change for some individuals, depending on what they were doing prior to. Because the nature of this disorder is very cyclic, meaning they'll have periods of quote-unquote normalcy and then they'll have flare-ups, there's a lot of fear and anxiety there because they can't predict when they're going to feel good and when they're not going to feel good. So what you tend to see in this population, they tend to withdraw from society. Okay? They stop making plans with their friends and their family because they get tired of having to break them because they don't feel good. The other thing they have to worry about is um, people 
quote unquote believing them. Okay? Because sometimes it's hard to see fatigue. It's hard to see that. And for a lot of people, if they can't see that something's actually wrong with you, they don't want to believe that something's wrong with you. Okay? One of the mainstays of treatments for SLE is steroids. Well, when you have steroids, then you have to worry about weight gain. So you see how all this is a cumulative effect and what it increases their risk of is depression, guys. Okay, so we gotta be on the lookout for signs and symptoms of depression. And you know anybody that's at an increased risk for depression, you're also at an increased risk for suicide because there's not a cure for SLE. It's something the person has to learn to live with. Again, what we need to realize is that while your symptoms vary from person to person, your fever is your classic sign, okay, that they're having a flare-up. So that is why with our people that have SLA, we teach them to monitor their, their temp every day. Okay. In addition to the butterfly rash, they can have things like this. I told you, let me turn this off. Juan, don't fall asleep on me here. I'm gonna turn it off just for a moment, okay? <laughs> just a moment. <laughs> okay, so this is called those discoid lesions. Discoid is like a Greek word, it means coin-like. So these are the lesions that the person can develop in addition to the butterfly rash, okay? So with these lesions, typically what we do is we will prescribe topical steroids to just kind of rub in them, to try and promote fading. But realize when you give someone those um, topical steroids that over time it will cause thinning of the skin. So you gotta kind of be careful with it and make sure you educate them on that. So in addition to um, their physical assessments, we do do some lab work. The lab work we do is immune-based. So here's the thing. We don't use a single lab test, as I tell you right here, to definitively diagnose it. There's currently not one. These all just lead to, so we look at, okay, what does the person present with, and let me look at their labs. So we'll do things like a CBC. Typically what you see is they'll have pancytopenia. Remember, that's a decrease in everything. We'll do a UA, and what you notice in their UA, because almost everybody has some form of kidney involvement, they'll have things like glucose, or they'll have things like protein in their urine, that a normal individual that has good kidney function shouldn't have, okay? Uh, we'll do things like an A and A level, okay? Typically what we will see is they have an elevated A and A level, okay? It's very common in this population. And then we can do things like your erythrocyte uh, sed rate. Again, it's typically elevated in SLE. And we can even do a serum complement. And your serum complement typically has low values. Okay. So then once we make the diagnosis of SLE, remember we can't cure it. Currently we don't have a cure. They're looking at things, but we don't have a cure for it. What we have to do is we have to treat it aggressively until it's remission. So that person's back to their baseline. Okay? We do that with medications, guys. So when we talk about medications, Things you'll see, I talked to you about the, um, the topical steroids. We also will use a medication called Plaquenil. Now when you look it up, it does, it is an anti-malarial agent, but what we have found it actually suppresses the inflammatory response. The only thing I'd be careful about with Plaquenil is it can cause some retinal damage, so the person's gonna need frequent eye exams there. Okay, we have found that out over time. They're gonna be on immunosuppressive agents, and they're gonna be on chronic steroids. Typically, our maintenance is PO steroids. Now, when they have a flare-up, we might have to bring them into the inpatient um, setting, and what we'll have to do is we'll have to give them IV steroids, and then we can also give them the monoclonal antibodies, okay? So remember with the monoclonal antibodies, what it does, it decreases your B cell survival, okay? So that being said, no live vaccines within 30 days. Okay, no, because think about it. Remember, didn't we talk about, um, we talked about antibody, we talked about B cells. We're giving them a medication that's gonna decrease their B cells. So if we were to give them a live vaccine, what could potentially happen? They could have a really bad case. Let's say, let's give them um, 
don't, I'm not really sure. Chicken pox. Let's say we gave them chicken pox. Okay? It's a live vaccine. They don't have anything to combat it, so that person can actually get a case of the chicken pox. Because remember, we're killing off their B cells. We're decreasing the number of B cells. So they wouldn't be able to produce the, the antibodies needed. So we would actually be giving it to them. So that's why I say no live vaccines within 30 days. Okay? The other thing we can do is we can do something called plasmapheresis. So in plasmapheresis, all we do is um, we remove plasma. The reason we remove plasma is plasma contains the B cells. The, the B cells are what's causing their issues. So if we remove them, then their symptoms are going to decrease. They're going to get back to their baseline quicker. So these are all options that, that we will do. Okay. Now, the other thing I want you to, uh, to think about is education. You have a great chart in your book. It is on page 357. Be very familiar with your chart, okay? So put a star by that because you're going to need to know your interventions for SLE. One of the biggest things, we want them to avoid UV light because we know that that will trigger a flare-up. If they're going to go outside, they need to wear sunscreen, okay? The little sun hat, the long sleeves if they're able to. Um, the other thing is it causes fatigue. So a lot of these interventions in here talk about um, managing fatigue. And skin care is very, very important. So we want to make sure they use a very mild soap, um, no fragrances. They need to um, use a lotion to keep them moisturized there. The other thing we need to talk to them about is stress. Okay, Stress, again, will trigger a flare-up. So we talk about ways to handle stress or avoid stress. And then because most of the people that have SLE are, are of childbearing age, we need to talk to them about the fact that pregnancy can stress the body out. And so oftentimes if they have SLE, they will either have a flare-up during or after delivery. So we just need to make them aware of that. Also, um, people who have SLE, they have an increased risk for miscarriage, um, stillbirth, or premature birth. So we're not saying that for them not to get pregnant, they just need to be aware of that, okay? So we can maybe um, be a little bit more proactive and a little bit more cautious with that population, okay? Jay, was that fast enough for you? Um, I'll, I'll say yes. <laughs> no, it wasn't. I know, y'all are done, y'all are done. Okay, that's all I have, so next, not next week, the following week, I will start with um, allergic reactions, and I will start with HIV. I'm going to have um, Miss Hewitt will be doing the lecture for um, allergic reactions. She's one of my master's students that's working on her education degree. And so I'll be in here, of course, but she's going to actually be delivering um, her lecture, so it'd be nice. Okay. Uh, and then we're going to have COVID at the end. Uh, Mr. Glass is going to do COVID for us. Uh, I, he said he will get PowerPoints to me, so I can get them to y'all the following week. So you can print them out before y'all come for that. Okay? Grades are released. Make sure that you sign up for that review. I'm trying to get done this week. Okay? And y'all have a wonderful, safe time. Sharon, if I can see you, and it's high.